The most popular question, and I don't know if either of you could, uh, are the correct type of scientist to answer this, uh, but uh, do casual Giants fan in, fans enjoy significant evolutionary opportunities in mating rituals righteously and significantly greater than Dodgers fans? That's his question. I, that's an <laughs> okay. evolutionary question. I just, I just, just do ortho. That's, that's all I do. See? Yeah, I, I think, Dying. you know, uh, well, we will get back to you on that. We will maybe plan a whole event just to <laughs> Maybe do, to a, explore do like that. a study or research. Or yeah, or yeah, we'll do a... We'll, we'll work on that one. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we'll have a, uh, an audience research project. Yeah. I think that's what we should do. Yeah, double blind can, study. Yeah, with experiments. With experiments, yeah. Yes. <laughs> sure. And field data. Um, okay. So, it seems as if men and women have different natural throwing motions. Is this true? If so, and why is it phys physiologically and evolutionary, uh, evolutionarily? Right. So, um, yeah, I mean, I, th I think there's a, a cultural, I mean, there's, there's certainly within sort of the What's the right word? The stereotype is that, you know, you throw like a girl. That was just like a that. joke, by the way. I just want to yeah. don't want to get any letters or anything. Um, but certainly there are boys that throw like girls and girls yeah. who throw like boys. Um, I think, you know, I think it's, it's, it's a matter of practice. Um, I think it's, um, you know, certainly we, we all have the, the abilities to do these things, but it's a matter of actually um, actualizing them. And, you know, for various reasons, if girls are not throwing that often, they're not practicing it, you know. Um, you know, I think the sort of the, the stereotypical girls throw is kind of lacks the kind of external rotation, right? And it's, a lot of it is just from the arm. And um, clearly it doesn't uh, produce as much power. I mean, if most of the power is in the shoulder, then, you know, that, that could explain a lot of it. But, I, you know, I, I don't think that means that girl, girls can obviously do that. I mean, if you, I showed that uh, one uh, picture of a softball. I mean, have you seen softball pitchers, fastball, uh, fast softball pitchers? I mean, it's amazing. Um, major league hitters can't hit those balls. Um, so they can do pretty amazing things with their arms as well. So I think it's largely just, you know, a matter of, you know, you know what kind of... Uh, uh, abilities they get shunted into, and if you're, you know, for whatever reason, girls just don't do baseball. They make them do softball, right? Yeah. And uh, as Moday Davis showed, you know, clearly a girl can throw with as much velocity as a boy. Um, there are other factors that will come in later. Um, you can't get a around the biology of the fact that men have testosterone, you know, and they're going to build big, bigger muscles. Uh, they'll have broader shoulders, um, and so the mechanics, the physics of it, will, will drive those differences, but certainly girls can throw just as well as boys, mechanically. What is it that really makes a, you know, a great pitcher? A great pitcher? Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, if you go, uh, I mean, there's the basics, right? I mean, the average, I mean, you gotta look at uh, certain things that the average guy, major league guys, they even get a look, they even get considered, you know? They got to be, and some teams won't even draft anybody greater than six foot three. I mean, shorter than six foot three. So that, you know, I'm out. <clears throat> six foot two. But, um, <laughs> but the physics of doing something repeatedly over and over again, right? It's not just enough to get there and throw, you know, it's to, to do it. And, you know, that's why, you know, people, I always go, like, that guy sucks. I go, that guy was probably the best player in his high school team, was probably the best player in his college team. And there's only 25 guys times 30. What is that? You guys do the math. But everybody else, I got 200 minor leaguers in, 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 in our minor leagues trying to get there. So you got to have some ability, I mean, some extreme ability to get there. So um, uh, for me, the difference is velocity, right? But you, you've seen at the major league level, you, you always ask, well, how come that AAA guy throws 97, that AA guy throws 97, 92, but he, he can't get any money? It's... It's the command and it's movement. And these guys are smart. I mean, you know, you know the Buster Posies and, you know, that's what I love about baseball. It's a count, constant, every pitch, every at bat, you're trying to outguess the other guy, right? Like, oh, he threw me a fastball up and in. I, you know what's going to come next. It's going to be a breaking ball away. But that's what's so funny. You know it, they know it, and yet they still can't 
a hard time hitting it, right? And so um, to me, it's the basic ability to throw over and over again, of course, the physical attributes, but what separates the Kershaw's, you know, I know I said it, but he's pretty good <laughs> after me. He's pretty good. The bums is that the, um, the, the command and the movement and the, um, you know, they just don't go out there and chuck it 97. You know, they get guys out. That's the difference between, I think, a minor league guy and a major league guy. But and to, not to over, over <laughs> step my balance on the other one, I think simply girls can throw. They just don't play baseball like guys play baseball, you know, growing up. Now, that, that's changed, you know. There's plenty of girls do it. So I think, in general, that humoral torsion, that retro, that's the biggest difference. The ability to get that layback, as we say, um, is, is hard and it develops over time. But you know, you have plenty of guys that can't do it and they throw like the Jetta commercial, right? And then, but I, I say facetiously that the girl that I go, there's plenty of girls that can kick my butt and they throw harder than I can. So, but, but as we get older, I think what Nate talks about in terms of velocity, I mean, you know, unfortunately, or fortunately for women, I don't know, to generate 95 miles of velocity over and over again, uh, that's, that's, that's a different, that's a different world. <laughs> so, anyways, that was just that. <laughs> there, um, one of the questions, or is there a question from the audience? Nope. Nope. Here. Oh, wait, let's get the microphone. Yeah. Uh, yes, this is Cook. Hello, hello. Uh, the question is mostly for Dr. Akizuki. A uh, guy like Aroldis Chapman, okay, considered the hardest, one of the hardest throwing. Does he have a greater range of external and internal rotation than most any other player? Um, uh, I've met a role as Chab, and he's massive. Uh, he's a big dude. Um, no, I don't think the external external rotation are any more than any less. I, you have plenty of guys, but I think, I mean, I, I don't know him personally, but a role as Chapman is probably a freak. Because... When I saw him come out, and I thought, 100 miles an hour, there's no way this guy throws 100 miles an hour. You know, it's probably that speed gun that I use, you know, at the fair, you know. <laughs> 80 kilometers. I thought it was miles an hour. It was 80 kilometers. But um, he's legit, you know. And he is an unbelievably strong guy and tall, and he's long. I mean, he's like maybe 6'5", but his length is, you know, and... I'm not a physics guy, but I think if you if you do the physics on that, like Randy Johnson, six foot ten, the ball is basically you know halfway through the mound by the time he releases it. I go, I mean, that's not that's not fair. <laughs> but what gets me about Chapman is that he does it over and over again. Over the years, his velocity hasn't changed, right? But if you notice that if he pitches, you know, you watch a World Series last year. He pitches two games in a row, three games in a row. He becomes human, right? He goes from 105 to like 99. Yeah, I could hit 99. <laughs> yeah, right. But the, but to me that he's he's uh um you know he's one of those like I'm just waiting for him to break down. I'm like, are you doing it over and over again? He's been doing it all his life since he was in Cuba, right? So I'm like, but man, he's you know he's good. But notice at the major league level. He's throwing 105, and he goes down to 99 and command, right? Chapman does not command very well. All you, know, you know you're going to get a fastball, right? At the major level, if you know you're going to get a fastball, they'll hit the fastball. You know, I can't, but they, they could. But, yeah, I, I don't know biomechanically. I try to explain. He's very long leg, very long arms, and he's about 6'5", so I don't know why, why you know, he's any different than anybody else. But at the major league level, anyways. I don't remember um, who said it, but there was botanists who said that they appreciated walking through a garden very differently than the average person does. And I know both of you enjoy baseball. How does it? How does knowing what you know change how you watch, as just a fan? Or do you have, do you ever have that moment where you can? How it changes I watch. Mm -hmm. uh, you, want, you want me to start with me here? Oh no! I yeah I, I don't. I don't actually think a lot about the evolutionary side when I'm watching it. I mean, I think it's pretty, you know, I think Ken had talked before about how, you know, he viewed uh, pitching as being pathologic at some level. I, I don't view it as being pathologic. I, I think it's a, it's, a, it's a normal human activity, and I think there's lots of things about our design that's, you know, um, 
that's optimized in many ways for throwing in the way that we do. And the major league pitcher, pitchers that we see are just this, uh, the, the cream of the crop. There's so much variability in modern humans. We have, you know, there's a, a great picture, I think after the Olympics, it was like Shaquille O'Neal versus uh, Simone Biles, right? You know, this extremes that you get selected for in Olympic athletes. And when you see these major league baseball players, they're really the extremes of human variability. Um, and they can really do amazing things with their body. Um, but I think the things that we subject them to um, in terms of athletes is really, you know, there's a business to it where they're supposed to throw balls really fast um, that sort of defies their natural limits. You know, there's an evolutionary angle to it where, you know, it becomes pathologic when you're throwing a ball, you know, too many times during a day. Um, and your body wasn't designed to do that. And so I, I, I think I think about that, you know, maybe on my off time, when I'm watching the game, I'm like, throw it as hard as you can, as fast as you can, you know, as much as possible, um, you know, strike out. Um, so, so, yeah, I think it's, uh, you know, I, I don't over-intellectualize it, I think. I mean, baseball is just a fun sport to watch. Um, but I think it really is amazing what these athletes can do, and it's really amazing to see sort of you know, what the extremes of human variability really can accomplish, um, given the right kinds of training, the right kinds of support. Yeah, I mean, in reference to pathology, obviously I'm an orthopedist. My pathology is, you say pathologic, it's just gonna wear down. Not that throwing's pathologic, it's just that the labrum, the cuff, oh, yeah. it's just a matter of time, if you keep doing it, it's gonna break down. Yeah. Um, but as far as my, Watching, obviously, I have a very different take <laughs> um, because it's all about injury, and and for me, I like to focus on injury prevention, which is you know what we spend half our time. But inevitably, we we're going to say uh, eventually in a twenty-year, fifteen-year career, they're going to have something. You know, I mean, most guys do. Most guys have you know have had their Tommy John or whatever prior to even getting to the big leagues, even in college. But for me. Uh, Maybe it's just the purest in me. Uh, the velocity guys are great, but I love watching a guy like Johnny Cueto. Johnny can throw 95 anytime he wants to, but Johnny has the perfect, you know, everybody thinks he's showboating out there. He, he's not, you know, he does a shake, he does a quick pitch. He's trying to get the batter off balance, right? That's what pitching is, is timing. Take the timing off, and he does it. He does it well. I mean, when he pitches well, it's fun. Even even the other pitchers and the coaches will watch him pitch, and he's a fun guy to watch. If you, you know, if you pick up those nuances, you know, I used to think when he when I was when he was in Cincinnati, I go, that guy sucks. What a showboat, man! And now I go, hey, he's awesome, man. That's great, man. Keep it going. But that's that's my take on that his innate ability to do that. Very few guys can do that. So. Do we have any more questions from the audience? Yeah, I remember several years ago, the uh, pitching coach of the New York Mets, Rube Walker, former catcher, he advocated what he called the drop and drive. Mm -hmm. Instead of you know, coming over the top and remaining upright, you drop down almost on your knees and then yep. push forward. Have you anything about that as far as preventing? Because I noticed Tom Seaver never had a sore arm, but he, had a, he just had a sore hip. Have you yeah. noticed anything like that? I mean, uh, for me, that's an old school uh, thought process. I love that thought process because basically, <laughs> not to talk shop, but we always have a connect chain, right? And I'm an old school guy who believes, or an orthopedist who believes that velocity and consistency start with the legs, right? So the shoulder, elbow, and arm are a product of the energy you throw, right? Tom Seaver is a classic example, but most of the guys in the old school days do that, right? And then <laughs> you talk to a guy like Rigetti, he'll say, it's pitch counts, yeah, whatever. I go, we never had pitch counts. <laughs> but now the emphasis is on velocity and movement, more movement, right? So if you look at most guys now, it's now stand tall and fall, right? And the reason why is that they get more movement on the ball, right? And so uh, the, I don't know, I don't know where, what, what create, caused that change or whatever. I, I guess, you know, you're just upping the ante on getting guys out, right? So, but I'm a, a huge proponent of the Tom Seaver, you know, because um, 
that's kind of why most old school coaches and old school guys will say it's all about the legs, right? Arm and the elbow, yeah, they're just long for the ride. You just got to keep them healthy. But endurance and being able to pitch for, you know, because it's six, seven innings at a time or whatever is all about the legs. So um, I actually, we, we support that, that premise. I think nowadays the modern pitching style goes against it. But when we do our rehabs, when we do our core stuff, okay? <laughs> I love saying that, core. Um, everything is on balance, single leg balance on the left and the right. Yeah? Every pitcher is at that level are pretty incredible at it. But you know, to your, I don't know if that answers your question, but you know, it's a philosophical thing these days, I think. So and, um, another question from um, meeting polls is, um, it was basically, um, are increasing pitching speeds um, down to uh, training and physics, or is it evolution in action? Right. Well, I mean, that's a good question. We, we don't know enough about the mechanics. I mean, I think that's one of the things that we're looking at right now is that, you know, to what degree do the anatomical variability, does the anatomical variability really affect function? Um, we're more interested in you know, everyday life, right? <laughs> we're, we're interested in whether you as a, a normal human being, not as the elite athlete, is going to produce uh, a rotator cuff tear, for example. Um, but certainly at the most extremes, um, the hope is that we'll be able to predict, you know, um, uh, relative disability just by um, the variability that we see. And for the most part, um, I think, you know, this is where an evolutionary stance is actually very useful because, you know, for example, you know, Ken had mentioned that when you look at an MRI, for example, you know, you find all these pathologies, you know, and the question really is, you know, are those pathologies or is that just normal variation? You know, um, there are interesting studies where people have actually done MRIs of completely asymptomatic individuals and they come in, they have rotator cuff tears with no degree, no, no aspect of function, functional difficulty. There are other, as, you know, other studies show where people come in and they have what look like, say, impingement. And they have it corrected by a surgeon, and afterwards they're no better than they were before. So the question is, is whether you know, we fully understand what the shoulder is doing, for example, and how that affects the function you know, of everyday tasks at one level, you know, that affects us as normal individuals, and then at the extremes, how it affects, you know, athletes, elite athletes, for example. Um, and I think there's, it's a continuum, obviously, and there, there are lots of uh, ways in which we can look at these different extremes um, to actually give us a really, a, a really interesting window onto how function, dysfunction, and normal and abnormal actually, what the interplay really is. And that they're not discrete things, but they're really a continuum. Um, to me, and, and I'm an evolutionary biologist, but the idea of evolution to me is like a slow change over time. And this is a rapid change in my book. So I think it, it goes to the fitness. I mean, our guys are, I don't know, I mean, if you look at the, the kind of bodies now compared to, in all due respect, to the Babe Ruth era, that's where I played, of course. Um, <laughs> <laughs> was they're bigger, stronger, fast. It's all about performance, right? So, um, so I think, you know, this is the natural, when I say natural, or kind of the, you know, I'm surprised it's such a significant elevation. But I, I think it's just the, um, uh, a, a cum uh, the result of the emphasis on fitness. I think our, our athletes are even more fit than they've ever been. You know, I mean, look at, I got high school kids, or 14 year olds that throw 91. I couldn't even throw 70 miles an hour when I was 14 years old. I got the six foot four kid throwing 91 miles an hour, and he's in, high, he's in junior high, right? So they're just more of them. The competition's higher, and, and not to get on my, my, my pedestal, but what is embarked in all this is PEDs, performance enhancing, yeah, you know. So I don't know anymore, <laughs> you know. Of course, I feel bad for all the guys who did it right during that era because, you know, but they get lumped into the entire era where I didn't know who was doing something or was doing something. And so, you know, there's that, there's that aspect of it too, you know. I mean, you're getting paid a lot of money 
if you can throw the ball 99 miles an hour. You know, you're like going, well, is it, is it worth it? You know, two to fronts, right? You, you know, you can be track and field. You can be the fastest na- athlete or runner who uh, not using any of the drugs. But you don't get a lot of medals for 10th place, but being, you know, not. So I think all that gets mixed in. I think baseball does a good job because there's testing now. So I think, you know, they've addressed that. But still, I think it's a... But I also think that's why we have so many injuries now. You know, guys are pushing their bodies and doing it harder and faster. And they look at the number of Tommy Johns, they're, they're, they're escalating, you know. And so I think ensuingly, you know, as performance goes, injuries go. So one thing I'd add to that is that, um, you know, I, I think there's, you know, evolution occurs by, you know, there there are things that you require to have for evolution to occur. One is variation and the other one is selection. I think at some level with elite athletes, what we're seeing is selection. It's a self-selected selection for the people that are at the very extremes of human variation. And so that's what I kind of alluded to before with, you know, Shaquille O'Neal versus Simone Biles. You know, that's almost as much variation as you see in um, domesticated you know, groups, right? You know, we have an amazing amount of variation. I think it's because, you know, we, we live in a time where we can, you know, human variation is really, you know, you know people talk about the end of evolution. I think evolution is still occurring, right? But um, at some level, we have freed ourselves in a way that, you know, we can have all these different types of bodies. And then we have different sports that really select for different body types. Mm-hmm. And as the incentives for having those different body types increases, the incentives to achieve those body types through either natural variation or unnatural variation are really increased. And that's really, it's, it's interesting, but it's also, um, you know, ultimately for it to be evolutionary, it require those things to have some fitness advantage, not fitness like, you know, I'm buff, but, you know, fitness like I have more children. You know, and that's unlikely to play out because these really are the extremes. But it, it's it's interesting to think about. Hmm. I think we have a question from the audience here. Yeah, um, I'm involved in youth sports, youth baseball, so I see a lot of variety in mechanics for throwing, where a lot of the kids that throw the hardest are using a lot of elbow. And you know, sometimes you think about well, maybe you should decrease some of that elbow and use more shoulder. Um, so my question is for either of you. Uh, which one do you, like as a doctor, do you sort of recommend some of your elite athletes to use a little more shoulder because it's a stronger part of the body than the elbow? Or, or, or can you, do you think some people can have a long lifespan pitching with only elbow? And, and that goes back to your, to the evolutionist, yeah. who's, uh, did our ancestors use a lot of shoulder to throw that spear? Or were they using a lot of elbow? Because these variations in throws are extreme in kids, and sometimes um, the guys with the worst mechanics throw harder. So do we push them to go towards another direction to, to make a have, yeah. a, have a longer yeah. lifespan in the sport? Yeah, so I mean, you know, back in the day, those kids wouldn't have been throwing, you know, 100 times a day at some, I don't know, antelope or something like that, or jackrabbit, right? And so... I mean, Ken can probably speak to this more, but I mean, just from the sort of the clinical literature, I mean, it's suggestive that, I mean, most of the injuries and most of the reconstructions that Ken probably winds up doing are these Tommy John surgeries. And so I, th- I really think that's the weak link. Obviously, you can speak more to it. Um, so, but it, the science is really unclear as to what's going on in the shoulder. We believe that there's this elastic storage of energy, and that's really where the arm and the elbow are really getting most of the energy from. Um, and so... You know, yeah, not to push you one way or another, but I mean, I, I, would, I would go for a more shoulder-centric thing just because of the injuries. But I think the main thing would be just the most suggestive thing is just that the number of pitches, not the velocity, is actually the most um, predictive thing of whether you're going to have an injury in your elbow, for example, or an injury just in general. And so pitch counts really are the things that you need to reduce. Um, and then, I guess, in terms of thinking about mechanics, I would, I would, I would steer away from the elbow. But uh, again, the science isn't clear. I, maybe Ken can speak more uh, concisely about the. The way I look at it is that kids that throw, I mean, I'll say they're, they're uh, with their elbow. Typically, they do that because their arm's not strong enough. 
right? Meaning that guys, kids that try to throw a breaking ball, they're just not strong enough to throw, and so basically they end up short-arming everything, right? And so, especially as the levels go up, you can't, I doubt that you're gonna be that successful at the, as levels go up if you're really just leading with your elbow. There's no way you can generate the velocity, there's no way you can generate the, the biomechanics um, of it. You really have to get that shoulder and that layback to take advantage of it to keep going up. And we also argue, as the shoulder goes, the elbow goes. Majority of elbow injuries, I think, are because bad shoulder mechanics, so you end up, see, it's classic, here's a classic example. They can't get back here, right? Whatever reason, their shoulder's tight, range of motion. But they're throwing 70 miles an hour, and they're like, I don't throw 70 miles an hour. I throw harder. What are they gonna do? They're gonna open up the front side, right? And they're gonna lead, right? They'll get a couple extra miles an hour, but they have no idea where the ball's going, right? But at least they got more velocity, right? That's that wild kid who goes, I oh, doesn't know where the ball's going, but his velocity's better. And that's, I think, you know, I mean, you're just out there, you're trying to get guys out, you're like, going, oh, I have a hard time getting guys out with, with what I have right now. So, and in the younger age, it's hard as, you know, women develop much faster. They're taller, they're stronger at age 12 and 13. Guys don't get, start growing. I don't know, I'm still waiting, but guys start, <laughs> start growing until like after 14, 15. You know, you look, at, you look at the guys like David Robinson was six foot six, six foot five, going to Naval Academy and comes out at seven foot one, right? Um, Strasburg was this scrawny kid in high school, nobody even wanted. And then by the time he finished San Diego State, he's like, you know, six five and throws 100 miles an hour. Guys tend to develop later. And I think what happens is that at a younger age, there's a lot of pressure to throw and it's hard when, you know, Tommy and Johnny are going to travel ball and your kids, and he's like, he's, I think those are, to me, it's not a matter of elbow or shoulder. There's a, I think, a sound way to throw. And that's basically, you know, with good mechanics and your shoulder is a major part of it. I think if you throw with your elbow, you're just basically pushing the ball. You're throwing like a football, you know, which is okay if you're throwing a football. But with the baseball, it's kind of hard to do that for a long time without hurting yourself. That's my, that's my opinion. But, you know. Right. And I, I think maybe one other thing is that, I mean, you had alluded to this before, is that, you know, really good pitchers eventually learn how to pitch. And maybe, you know, part of the problem is that, you know, speed is a crutch, right? And so it's always like, I want to throw faster because you're not going to be able to chase the ball and hit it, right? Um, but then that puts less emphasis on sort of the, the real sort of fascinating part about pitching, which you, when you really get into it, is the chess game, yeah. right? Between you and the batter, like what pitch do you choose? You know, one of my favorite pitchers was Tim Wakefield because he could throw these crazy, you know, crazy knuckleballs, right? And the fun thing about knuckleball is that it's so slow, but you can't guess where it's going, right? You don't have a clue what's going to happen with it yeah, in terms of spin, catcher, right? So. Um, and yeah, the pitcher doesn't, or the catcher doesn't either. Um, but but that sort of like Greg Maddox like intellectual aspect of pitching is sometimes I think de-emphasized um, in terms of you know the relative velocity. This is get faster, um, and so maybe at some level, you know, because most most. The, the vast majority of people who play baseball are never going to be major league baseball players. Yep. The vast majority. Yep. So let's not have 14 year olds who need Tommy John surgeries, right? Let's focus on teaching them a love of the game and the, the science of the game, but also like the, the mental part of the game. You know, uh, what is it that it takes to out, outsmart that batter? You know, what are their tendencies? What do they like to do? And you can get away with a 70 mile an hour pitch um, if the pitcher, if the catch, uh, the pitcher, uh, excuse me, the hitter doesn't know what he's, what's coming. It doesn't matter how fast or slow the ball is; they're not going to hit it. So, yeah, but that's not sexy. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, you know, ninety-five. That's yeah. No, the scars on people's arms are not sexy either. So, yeah, especially on a fourteen-year-old. Yeah. All right. Well, I've got to thank you both so much. I'm All sure right. we could go. All right, with the number of questions I have on here, we'd be here another two hours. I think we so. lost the people who questioned us. So uh, <laughs> yeah, they can catch it in the video. Oh, that's so. true. That's true. Yeah. But if anyone in the audience has a question, then I'd be happy to take one more. Yeah, the, uh, they'll be hanging around a little bit, so don't 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 crowd them. Uh, give them some space to breathe. We've had yeah, that's right. 
people getting crowded before. But anyway, I want to thank you all for coming in. Please give a round of applause for our two wonderful speakers. Thank you.